Peter Zinn is live at Boston Biotech, and I am absolutely delighted and honored to have the legendary Tony Hoover <laughs> with us today. Tony, welcome. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Anthony. Honored. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Um, Today in this interview, uh, I'd love to go through some of your experience at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, your time uh, you know, at Pfizer, innovation, leadership, gender, a lot of things to discuss. But maybe first of all, we can just start with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, it says on the website that Sue Desmond Hellman, the CEO, mm -hmm. as you know, I don't need to tell you that, um, of the foundation, recently wrote a letter that says, there's one question that unites those of us who work at the Gates mm -hmm. Foundation, and that is, what if? Mm -hmm. what, did, what did she mean by that? Yes, yeah, so at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we firmly believe that all lives have equal value. So what if we actually acted like that in, in the world? What if what determined your, who you are didn't depend upon where you were born? Mm -hmm. um, what if we could bring forward uh, and apply all of what we've learned uh, about health, uh, preventing diseases, um, living healthy lives uh, in uh, the best of what we know from high in, in high income countries and be able to apply all of that technology, that out, those outcomes to those who are living in the poorest of the poor conditions around yeah. the world. What if you could eradicate polio completely off of the face of this earth? What if you could eradicate malaria? What if you can uh, stop and really have an impact on all of those illnesses that uh, hold communities down from being as pro prosperous as they could be? What if you can empower women and girls to be all that they could be and really uplift their communities? That's what we think about every day at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's, it's, mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, it's a powerful question, mm -hmm. clearly a powerful question. And you mentioned there a lot of uh, very, very good uh, objectives or missions or purposes, I suppose. But how, mm -hmm. when you are in a very privileged position mm -hmm. with quite a lot of cash behind mm -hmm. uh, the foundation, do you decide yeah. to put those investments. I mean, right. what, what, how do you decide between this cause being yeah. more important than others, for example? Yeah. All of our strategies start from an understanding of the disease burden. And then we build strategies around uh, ways that one could impact that, that burden. So what we then do is determine what's the most cost-effective approach to deliver the greatest impact. And once we make those types of decisions, all based on data, we then work to with our partners on executing um, those plans and supporting with the investments in those partners, whether it's product development, um, delivery partners, uh, making those investments mm -hmm. so that they can execute those plans to try to deliver the um, impact and reduce the number of people who are being infected with, mm -hmm. with um, uh, tuberculosis, who live with tuberculosis, and also who die from yeah. tuberculosis. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. What, what do you think, uh, Tony, about some of those high-profile entrepreneurs that are mm -hmm. talking about giving broadband uh, through satellite uh, access to, uh, you know, sub-Saharan Africa? I mean, is that mm -hmm. where the money should be spent, or is it more on the ground at the level that you guys <laughs> are at? Well, I mean. I, needless to say, I, I'm not in a position to tell people um, uh, how to spend their dollars. I think yeah. it's important um, that we have more individuals who are um, well-to-do, who are, are willing to be philanthropic. Yeah. Uh, and who want to be able to do good. Yeah. Um, there are a number of different ways that that can happen. Um, yeah. We've made some decisions about how we want to um, uh, help the world become a better place yeah. and uh, be much more equi equitable. Yeah. Um, there are others who, as you say, um, want to increase equity by increasing um, the, their ability to be part of the world through um, the internet and broadband. I think 
you don't, it's not an either or, it's no. an and. Okay, that's good. Uh, it's an and. Yeah. Because bringing that type of capabilities um, to, to the poorest of the poor, yeah. to the communities where they do not have yeah. um, access to broadband yeah. um, services will allow, open up more opportunities, um, even in the space that we're working in. Um, we're working in our financial services at the poor yeah. around mobile applications that will enable um, individuals in remote areas, and particularly women, to do banking. Love it. And make, make investments. Love it. So as you said, it's, a, it's, it's an and, it's building mm -hmm. on. And I suppose uh, companies like Facebook, for example, they increasingly create groups, user groups mm -hmm. of the same, yep. who've got the same diagnosis and they go and they support each other. So exactly. I see exactly what you mean. Um, Tony, what you mentioned there about encouraging people to be more philanthropic, I'd love to get your advice at two levels. Number one, what would be your advice to somebody who is now worth tens or hundreds of millions? Um, should they set up a foundation? How can they practically, mm -hmm. practically be more philanthropic? Is it just making a donation to, yeah. uh, to the Bill and Melinda Gates? What can they do? And secondly, for the people that are on normal salary, yeah. um, is there anything that they can do to be more philanthropic if they're mm -hmm. struggling to make ends meet themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for each of those extremes, <laughs> yeah. I think the important thing, this is the way I would I think about it, is to know what you're passionate about and understand that regardless of what approach you might take, that you can make a difference mm -hmm. and be focusing on um, the ability to have an impact. Um, We've had an, I've, I've been able to um, sit in on a couple of conversations with um, uh, individuals and, and their surrogates who want to be more philanthropic, um, high net worth individuals. And I think the first step would be to sit, step back and do some learning, mm. learn from others. Um, who've been in the philanthropic space. Um, learn what's worked well, what hasn't worked well, um, it, what um, are any regrets that individuals have made, uh, and but continue to focus on how what they're passionate about and how they might be able to deliver impact mm -hmm. and to continue to think about those what if questions. What if um, their contributions can change the world in one way? Yeah. Now, for normal folks like me, um, I, I think it's so easy to be able to give back to society. Um, I started very young um, with March of Dime drives um, in school. Children, grade school children can have an impact. Um, you can then move on to making um, contributions of your time um, in volunteering. You see so many more younger people um, who are focused on um, social impact and volunteering. And I'm uh, so enamored by the work that is being done uh, by the Global Citizens Organization where you um, can do well by doing good deeds. Mm -hmm. uh, and so wherever you are in society, whatever your station is, you can do well and do good deeds um, with whatever you can contribute, whether that is your time, your knowledge, um, or your uh, discretionary resources. Great, that's brilliant. So it's not just about checkbook philanthropy, it's yeah. giving time exactly. as well. And going exactly. To, that's a phenomenal point. You mentioned just before, Tony, that um, you know, whether you're a super wealthy, high net worth individual or just somebody on a normal salary, focus on the passion. Mm -hmm. um, what are you passionate about? Yeah. What are the causes that you are passionate about? Well, um, I grew up in, in New Orleans, and my father was a United Methodist minister, and he was in the school system. He was a teacher that rose up into administration of a high school in New Orleans. So I've always, um, and my mother was um, also in the school system, working with young children in pre-K as well as elementary school. Um, so I've always been in um, a home where uh, we thought about others and doing well for others. So that has driven me 
um, through, throughout my life and wanting to be able to give back. And uh, I was able to do that for 25 years being part of um, the pharmaceutical research and development um, industry um, in researching, developing new potential new treatments for Alzheimer's disease, um, a devastating illness. I was part of the team that um, brought the first um, treatment for the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease to market globally. Um, and then having the opportunity to lead um, the product development of um, another agent for um, some um, devastating illnesses, for neuropathic pain, uh, uh, for seizure disorders, um, Lyrica, which is um, on the market right now and, uh, and, and helping millions of people. So I've always had this desire to be able to give back where um, I could work in a team that was working for a common mission and common purpose of helping people live healthier lives. So it's a privilege uh, to be part of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where we are working to um, eradicate polio. My father had yeah. polio oh. as a child and when I was um, uh, thinking about joining the Gates Foundation, I thought about him and what my aunts used to tell me about how difficult it was for him as a child when he had to stay inside, when he was ill, um, how it affected his childhood. And to think that um, back in 2011, um, India became polio um, free and that we only have a couple of uh, places, tough places, in the world where polio still exists. Um, I'm confident that within um, a, a very short while, we'll be able to declare that, that yet another devastating illness uh, virus has been eradicated off the face of this earth. Yeah. So being able to bring um, what I was able to, to um, learn, um, over the 25 years of working in a great company like Pfizer, being able to take that, those learnings and being able to apply it um, for the sake of um, the global health issues that we're tackling um, is, is uh, something that uh, is extremely gratifying and continues to drive me each and every day. No, it's beautiful. It's a wonderful, if you want to give back, you can't get much better than being in, exactly. in that foundation. Um, by the way, do you hang out? Do you, do you see Bill and Melinda a lot? And do you, are they hanging out at the office once in a while? I wouldn't say I hang out with <laughs> Bill and Melinda, um, but they are very accessible and I'm often in meetings with them. Um, we have, um, uh, they are very much hands on as we are making very, very important strategic decisions. Yeah. They are very concerned about. Um, how the foundation is run, how um, uh, the, the colleagues within the foundation, um, what the culture is in, in our foundation. Um, and they are um, a, a learning couple and they embed that throughout our organization that we want to learn and continue to learn so that we know um, and continue to grow in different directions. We are a very data-oriented organization, um, and they continue to test us and remind us uh, and help us uh, discern how we make decisions based on data. So they're, they're quite visible, but I'm, I would not say that I hang out with Bill and Melinda. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I met somebody that once who said he'd been to Harvard University, but he'd only been to have a look around. It's nice. <laughs> um, Tony, what would you um, say, I mean, before, we, uh, this, before this program, we were talking about some of the things you're passionate about as well, being um, mm -hmm. making sure that women have the equal, an equal place mm -hmm. in all um, uh, areas of society, and it drives me nuts that there may that this is even still an issue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it really does. And yeah. I've got a, a daughter and a son. Yeah. And I just you know want this issue to go away. Yeah. Um, but but what's your thoughts on on yeah. that? How has it been improved? What advice would you give to a young yeah. woman? So I, I uh, participated in a panel discussion last evening. Um, 
a panel on women in leadership in the life sciences, and where we focus particularly on some of the obstacles still facing women in life sciences. Um, so I just want to spend a, a moment sure. talking about that. Um, I think that there are many opportunities to accelerate of uh, the the um, remarkable talent in life sciences across a number of different industries within life sciences um, in a, a much better way. One of the things that I learned from my experience um, is that is the importance of sponsorship, of having um, key leaders in the org in an organization who will um, use their own personal um, capital to help advance um, the advance others in an organization. Um, they, that, that's definitely being done um, with men. It's being done, the, the data show, the research show that it's being done to a lesser degree with women. Right. Spon mentorship is important, but it's not sponsorship. I know from my own personal experience um, that I would not have been uh, been able to rise to where I was um, in Pfizer without having sponsorship from key senior leaders in my organization. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to do that uh, in my organization. Um, you knew, sponsorship, is, um, it, mentorship is you, you are working with someone who ha is sharing their experiences um, and giving you advice. Um, but they may not be able to help you get that next position. Right. Sponsorship is mm. individuals who are key decision makers, movers and shakers in an organization who can actually make it happen for um, a person. They are in the rooms when you're ha when um, people's names are coming up for potential jobs. Um, they are in the rooms when senior leaders are talking about secession plans, and they can bring forward the name of someone that they know and they feel confident about, and they are willing to put their necks out on the line mm. to help get that person in that position. Yeah. So that's what the difference between mm. mentorship and sponsorship. Um, the other thing is um, that can help accelerate women um, in life sciences is um, uh, to be able to help them deal with some uh, critical periods in their time, uh, particularly for women who want to start families. The research demonstrates that you start to see women leave um, life sciences uh, uh, positions um, because of intense environments and because they want to start these fam the families. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're doing at the, that we've done at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is um, implement a benefit for all colleagues, uh, men and women, um, around parental leave, whereby um, you get 52 weeks of paid leave um, when you bring a, a child into this world or if you adopt a, a child and you're guaranteed the same salary when you come back after a year and a role at the same level. As well as um, uh, during that period, we work with the individuals to help make their transition easier. It's important that, that we think about those on-ramps for, for um, um, colleagues who are taking this time off. So being able to potentially close those gaps, keep more women in um, the sciences and uh, allow them to have both their families and be able to take the time that they need to ensure that they're starting their children off on the right footing yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is critically important. And yeah. uh, much more broadly, um, we work on, um, we're very committed to empowering women and girls around the world. Uh, the, the research is uh, indisputable that when you do this, not only do the women uh, uh, become more productive, the communities that they live in, their families uh, benefit greatly. And so we are s focusing a considerable amount of our efforts uh, on 
um, helping to uplift women and girls around the world, especially those who are um, in the, the poor, low and middle income countries. Wow. That's amazing. So uh, this is why you'll be uh, tap dancing to work in the morning. That's yes, a, exactly. One, one buffet, exactly. It's line. Um, you were talking there about time away and people being. Is that for both uh, women and men? Yes, so it is. Okay, so I want to apply for a job at the bottom. <laughs> I just had my two kids, so I've missed my opportunity now. I don't think I you can know. You can adopt. <laughs> I can adopt. Yeah, it, it works with adoption too. I'm not sure my missus would say yes to that. No. But um, but that's amazing because that's very much like Scandinavia. And Scandinavia, you know, uh, men uh, take more paternity time. They mm -hmm. see it almost is equal in the house, and so therefore yeah. more equal equality in yeah. the workplace as well. So. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But I I know quite a few. Um, of my male colleagues are taking time off too, and I'm in, very encouraged by seeing that. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. fantastic. Really good stuff. Um, practically, um, uh, just a quick question on, on this, Tony. Practically, I know, at least in the UK, a lot of organizations see diversity at the top, mm. at, at the top equals greater innovation, mm -hmm. uh, greater profitability, mm -hmm. greater representation of their customer base, all of these, mm -hmm. so it's, it's ticked, it seems, in the conscious mind. But mm -hmm. is it about tackling it at the unconscious level mm -hmm. of g gender stereotypes mm -hmm. that, are, that are way back there? I mean, yeah. do, is it at that level? How can we tackle mm -hmm. it at that level? Is that, is that just a matter of uh, time yeah. that's gonna solve that, you think? I... I'm not, I'm not sure. I, um, I'm hopeful that as we become a more um, diverse um, society yeah. that um, um, some of those stereotypes will start to break away. Yeah. Um, but there are also things that are happening in our society, especially in this country right now, that um, make me pause um, and say that there is so much more that needs to be done um, to bring these issues um, to the conscious level. Um, there's been such a considerable amount of work done right here um, in uh, the Boston, Cambridge area by um, uh, Professor Banaji, um, who at Harvard, who is one of the preeminent experts on um, unconscious bias. And um, the, her work indicates that we all have biases, which means that we all have to come to um, our work, particularly the work that we do at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with um, a certain set of cultural competencies um, that um, uh, may not necessarily, you may not necessarily be able to um, discern on the surface if someone um, that you're working with has those cultural uh -huh. competencies. Um, so it's important to be able to help mm. people to um, see where their blind spots might be. That's actually the name of Dr. Bernaggi's book, The Blind Spot. Yeah. Um, understand what those blind spots are and try to uh, tamp down some of the mini stereotypes. Um, diversity, diversity does, and inclusion, I firmly believe, and the research bears this out, um, allows for a greater innovation, that you cannot have innovation without diversity yeah. of thought, um, diversity of experiences. Um, uh, innovation is a team sport. Yeah. Um, you have to have the, the, uh, a, a well, high-performing team. And it's hard these days to innovate without having um, diversity amongst um, in our midst, mm. and um, I, I think it's it is um, important and for us to be very intentional uh, when we're thinking about diversity and inclusion around what does that look like, what does that feel like, yeah. um, what does good look like, what are the outcomes, and be able to um, measure and. Uh, what are the um, the impact of potentially mm. not having mm. um, a diverse and inclusive environment? Um, yeah. The data is clear yeah. about this That's issue. True. 
That's true. And so maybe where individuals have got unconscious bias, that's where organizations can come in and help through allowing, putting some structures in place to make sure that they overcome that. Exactly. Um, let's talk about um, leadership, if, mm -hmm. if we can. Um, now, Tony, you are a remarkable leader. Uh, you've got a huge fan base. Um, and you've been surrounded by remarkable leaders uh, in mm -hmm. your lifetime as well. So in your essence, what do you think makes for great leadership? You have to serve others. You have to be there um, to help others be the best that they can be. Um, I've tried to do that in my, my own um, way on a daily basis that if you can create that environment that allows people to be who they um, are in a very authentic way and to bring all of their gifts and talents to work every day, not leaving a part of themselves in the parking garage or at home, um, because the work we do is so important, but who, bringing all of who they are, all of their gifts and talents, um, if you can allow for that type of an environment to take place where they are able to be, be as productive as possible and be able to break out of certain boundaries and be boundarylessness as they are going through the day and tackling problems. I think that's what a good leader is supposed to do. A good leader is also supposed to run interference. Uh, for their teams, for individuals. They're supposed to remove obstacles so that um, they can get the work done, um, as well as being able to help people grow and uh, meet the, some of what their goals and expectations are for their own careers. Mm -hmm. um, I've, that's what I try to do, and that's what I've learned and taken from the good leaders um, that I've had the fortune of being around um, throughout my career. I tell you, I'd certainly want to follow you. That sounds, uh, <laughs> sounds amazing because you said right at the beginning about um, learning from leaders that you admire and leaders that you don't think are so good. That's mm -hmm. exactly what Warren, Warren Buffett said mm -hmm. as well, is that look, make a list of the good attributes yes, and the list of exactly. them and just don't do those ones. Yeah. Tony, I know you've got to go and get, catch a flight, and um, I don't want you to miss it because I really do appreciate your, your time here. It's not very good. Um, so I've just got one other question for you, and it came in from somebody who, who'd studied you back in our office, and they said, my goodness, Tony is on boards. She's doing this. She's saving the world. She's you know, doing all these things. Um, how, from a sort of a personal time management mm -hmm. perspective, how do you, do you have any tips for us as to how yeah. to get more stuff done and the right stuff? Yeah, I'm still trying to get tips from other people, so maybe you can help me <laughs> <laughs> on that note. Well, one of the things I do is um, identify my priorities, um, how I want to spend my discretionary time. Um, and that has helped me make decisions about what, what boards I want to participate on, and I've made some decisions about um, focusing in on education, um, uh, in higher institute, higher ed institutions, on healthcare, on cultural um, issues. I'm on the board of the Pacific Northwest Ballet in Seattle. Um, also giving back uh, to the in the communities that I live. Um, but I also think about um, being in harmony. And I sp spoke a little bit about this at the women's leadership panel last night. Um, that. It's important for me on a day-to-day -day basis to be in harmony. Now that might mean that um, I'm doing a lot of work um, in, uh, at my job, but also um, what can I do to get what I need and be energized once I go home. And I'm fortunate to have um, a great partner. My mother lives with me. We, I have three. Um, standard poodles who um, love me and when I come home I get the best welcome um, that anyone can get. They do their little poodle dance. Um, but the, the concept of harmony right. and staying in harmony um, mm. is something that has been with me for um, quite a bit of time now and I 
try to, to manage that on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, I can tell you my um, business partner um, will be able to detect when I'm out of harmony. Um, mm -hmm. Usually when I have too many meetings back to back to back in one day. Um, but more, more than anything, it's doing things that drive the passion in me. Yeah. Um, and that's what I do every day at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Yeah. And so that helps to keep me in harmony. That's right. And that brings us all the way back to your advice for ph philanthropists, find your why, as Simon yes. Sinek says, find your passion. Exactly. And everything else flows into, into place. Tony, on behalf of all of our viewers watching, uh, I really want to say thank you so well, thank much. Thank you so much, Anthony. For your time today. Thank it's you a pleasure. So much, Tony. Thank you. Thank you.